There may be some questions from this, so uh, I'll just go in the order here on the screen. Uh, looks like Clint is up there. Clint, do you have a question or comment? A very well balanced uh, presentation. Thought it was right on the money. Really do appreciate it. It is certainly worthwhile to have this discussion. And so thank you very much for uh, excellently presenting. Thank you much. Thank you, Clint. Uh, Elwood, Elwood, do you have a question or comment? No, I think we're good. Thank you so much for the lesson. It was a great lesson. All right, thank you. Uh, Lenny and Lisa, do you have a question or comment? Hey, Eric. Hey, Lenny. Was, uh, 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 I can relate to what you said about, uh, you know, doing the copies and getting them all collated. Cause, you know, I was in a profession uh, that was dominated by women. For 20 years, so my copies were uh, not the best, but uh, yeah, and, and it, it, that's what they're good at, you know, that, that that's a horrible thing I just said. No, that's I, what women are good <laughs> at doing. I mean, their, their lesson plans were perfect, and their little presentations to the children were perfect, their root. It would take me 20 minutes to decorate my room at the beginning of the year, and it would take them, like, you know, five, all day. Yeah. Doing all day decorating your room. So, but it's, it's the way God created them, and it, it, that's a good thing. It's mm -hmm. not a bad thing. Absolutely. It's not yep. a bad thing at all. Not a bad thing at all. I, uh, I've, I've done a couple little studies, just personal studies, because uh, we, we have some folks we hang out with that – Aren't right dividers, and that uh, there, there's some magnificent faithful women in the scriptures. Yes, you know they really are, and um, I, I think that makes a good study. You know, not mm -hmm. just to say who they are and when they lived. You know, what did they do? What, what, how was their faith counted to them? You know, to be faithful to God, and God used their personality as women their whole psyche as women to do with uh, Timothy, Timothy's mother and, and grandmother. You know, I love yeah. those two ladies. I can't wait to meet them one day. You know, they did a great job with Timothy. And um, seeing kids today, as you, uh, as you keep bringing up, you know, seeing children today brought up by the computer, the TV, uh, anybody but mom, you yeah. know, uh, Sad. It's a very sad situation. Very sad situation. We, we loved it. My my better half and I loved it today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, an interesting study. Like you say, uh, one thing about Jesus, you look at him, all his disciples forsook him and fled. Who were the first people to see him rise from the dead? It was yeah. women. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because they adorn the doctrine. It's like women, yeah. once they get it, then they do it. It's just, but for men, it's it's a lot harder. It's like our flesh is more stubborn for some reason, and so the yeah. disciples they forsook him, but women are right there. Yeah, so uh, it's them. Uh, women adorn that doctrine. It's great to see. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Um, Eric, before I ask the question, uh, Scotty sent me a message to uh, to read. She said, thank you for the clarification of a woman's place in the church and in the home. I agree that all <clears throat> that the word has said is my proper place in the church and in the home. Excellent message today from Scotty. Thanks, Scotty. We love you and appreciate you. And we, we've been praying for you and hope uh, your uh, your voice problem gets gets better. Thank I you, Scotty. I give an update. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. She's hoping to have surgery again Friday. She went to see a, a doctor Thursday to get a second opinion, and the doctor said that she needs to have the tumor out as soon as possible. Mm. It, it, it is interfering with her swallowing and clearing Ooh, her throat. Um, I think breathing a little bit, too. I may be wrong about that. But definitely, definitely interfering with her voice. Her voice is getting worse and worse. So they're hoping this Friday, coming Friday, to remove the tumor again, 
and they may have to remove part of her larynx so that it won't grow back. But that's a big mm. question. Do they remove part of the larynx or do they not? Mm. And because this is an invasive surgery to keep doing this could damage her larynx. So it's just a difficult time for Scotty. Yeah. And you know, having this thing growing back, it's only been since the weekend before the storm, August 28th or is when it was removed. So it's back again and big yeah. again. So it's perplexing. And so we, we should keep our, Scotty in our prayers this week and this doctor who will do, the same doctor will do the surgery again Friday. And um, Would you go ahead and Lisa say a prayer for her while everybody's here? Surely, yes. Father, thank you for Scotty. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, that she has believed in your death, burial, and resurrection through your son, Jesus Christ, for her sin. Thank you, Scotty, that, thank you, Lord, that Scotty has your life in her, your Holy Spirit is in her, your word is in her. And Father, you can bring peace to Scotty, even though her physical circumstances are very, very difficult right now. And Lord, we do pray that this doctor will do this surgery well Friday. We do pray that this surgery can be scheduled so that she can have this tumor removed again. And Lord, if it be possible, it would be so wonderful if this could be the last time it has to be removed. And if Scotty's voice could return, Lord, and she could just start living again. She knows your truth, and she wants to proclaim the truth of your word to her friends, her family. To me, Lord, she's been a blessing to me. Thank you, Father, that Karen learned right division from Helen and brought body to us. And we just lift her before you, our sister. We lift her to you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Um, Erica, and thank you for the message. Um, you know, I've, I've learned over the years that as a, as, a, as a woman, we want to be in control of everything because we want everything to be okay, and we love our family, love our friends, and we, want, we just have this desire to make sure everything's okay, and it, it can cause a battle, you know, because Lenny's mind is so different from mine, and it's what brought us together. So I've learned over the years that I need to listen to my husband. God's put him in my life to love me, to point me to Christ, to build me up, to encourage me in the Lord. And it's been a great thing for me to learn over the years. As time has gone on, it's, it's just been beautiful. And to get into God's Word and to know that, that God has put money over me. And we still have our times of, I don't agree, and I'm going to speak my mind. But we, we come together, and, and Lord, I mean, God's like, Lisa, listen to your husband. He's, he's in your life for a reason. So just, I wanted to get that, that brief testimony. Um, and the flesh is always there going... You know, you know more, and you, you need to do this, but, but it, that's the flesh. And God's like, God's like me, says, Lisa, your husband, he knows Christ, he knows your word, listen. So, anyway, I wanted to give that brief testimony. And, um, and I thank God for Lenny. I thank God that he always encourages me in the Lord. Always, always. Um, but Eric, I had a question. When, when Jesus was walking this earth, um, the gospel for salvation. I read in John 1, 1 last night where it said, um, but as many, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of flesh, what, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then I thought about how Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. So I was thinking, was, and, and also like the lady that asked Jesus to heal her daughter, and, and she said, Master, <clears throat> when the dogs eat from the crumbs of the master's table, her faith made her whole, her faith. So was that kind of the three ways of salvation when Jesus walked this earth? Was it believe in his name? Was it you must be born again? And then by faith? Am I thinking correctly on that? Well, it's by faith uh, regardless of uh, dispensation. Because as we read today, Hebrews eleven six, without faith it is impossible to please God. 
So basically, God requires you to have faith in whatever He's told you. And when you, have, when you do that, then you have salvation. Um, for Israel, the message for them at that time was uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they were to stop trusting in their own righteousness and trust in God to save them. And then they were to be water baptized to show to separate themselves from the apostate nation. Uh, so that was the message. Now when it comes to believe on his name, that's what's implied in that. Uh, just like John 3.16, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a more generic statement, basically, is if you believe on his name, believe, uh, or uh, what John 3.16 says, uh, believeth in him. Uh, that's basically believe on his name or believeth in him just means to believe the message that he's given at that time. You're believing on Jesus to save you rather than, um, rather than your own religion. They didn't really know, until you get to Paul, they don't know it's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. That gospel is not revealed to given to Paul. So they don't really know the details of how they are to be saved. Uh, they just know that, um, that God is going to save them and not their religion. So they just need to repent or change their mind about following their religion, put themselves under what God has established, that uh, covenant that God made with Israel, and then be water baptized to show they're not part of the apostate nation. And so believe, uh, believe on his name, or whosoever believeth in him, uh, those are just generic statements saying that you trust in God to save you rather than your religion or to trust in man to save you. The born again is uh, what happens to Israel, as he said in, to Nicodemus. He, did, he didn't say you have to believe that you're going to be born again in order to be saved. He just said, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And that's what happens when you believe, when you believe what God has told you. Uh, so, in Israel, if you're in Israel's program, if you're at the hand phase of the kingdom, then as a Jew, you are to repent, stop trusting in your Jewish religion, trust in God to save you, believing that God will do it through Jesus, basically. That's how you believe in Him or believe on His name. And you don't know the details of how He's going to do it, dying on a cross, but you do know that He's going to, that you trust in God to save you and then be water baptized to show you're part of that believing remnant. If you're a Gentile, like the, uh, what was it, the, the woman? You, you mentioned a woman, and now I forget which woman it was. The woman in Matthew 15 that wanted yes. Jesus to her daughter, and, they, and Jesus did not answer her. Yeah, and she said the, crumb, the dogs eat of the crumbs table, uh, the fall from the master's table. Yeah, that's a Gentile woman. So God did not have a religion for her. It was basically the message to her was bless Israel. Um, so she would believe on him or believe on his name by uh, recognizing that she uh, that Israel has favor nation status and then therefore she should bless Israel. And that's why Jesus says he commended her for her faith because she had faith in what God told her as a Gentile, which was to bless Israel and that she was underneath Israel. So that's why she says, I recognize that you are only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and I'm a Gentile, but even a dog gets to eat the crumbs that falls from the master's table. So I recognize my position in that program, and I then recognize that I can still be blessed, even though Israel is above the Gentiles. And that's why Jesus says, I haven't seen such faith like this even in Israel. Because Israel has favorite nation status, they've got the oracles of God, and they didn't believe me, and here you're a lower standing in that program, and yet you still believe me, and you're still going to be blessed. So, really, the, the way you're saved, it doesn't matter what dispensation you live in, the way you're saved is by faith. You just believe whatever God has told you, and whatever that is, then you're saved. And uh, so the believe on Him, on His name, and believe in Him is just a generic way of saying you follow what God has said. And it's through Jesus Christ that all of us have salvation, um, you know, regardless of dispensation. So that's why that's there. And the born again is just uh, what Israel 
is when they believe the gospel and when they get the atonement at Jesus' second coming, they're born again at that time. So it's not really the gospel. The, the gospel at that time was repent and be baptized for Israel, and for the Gentiles it was to bless Israel. Okay. Thank you, Eric. So Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Lenny and Lisa. Uh, Danny and Shelley, do you have any questions or comments? tonight, I was, I was interested to hear this one. Um, when I first read this years ago, it, feels really, it felt really brutal because everything I have been taught and taught by my mother was contrary to this. Um, and my mum took a very dominant position in the household. She kind of ran everything. Um, so it was just a comment that it's there's a lot to unlearn, so much, not only in right division, but then but this, because this seems to be so strong in the world, um, and just that it's a lonely road, because even with yeah. other Christian women that I may know, this seems to be a tipping point or a bit of a deal breaker. Um, they, they literally look at you like you're a bit mad. I realise now my position is to do what my husband says, but you're you're fighting against so much on every level because it's just not seen as as what we do now. We don't do that. You know that was written like you said thousands of years ago, and even women who believe the gospel say to me, "You can't really believe that. You, you can't call. really think that that's the way you're supposed to behave now." Or do something with me, contrary to what your husband says. Um, it's just what a lonely road it is. I, you know, I don't know if other people feel that way, because it, it has become so prevalent in society that you're seen as the strange one. Also, if I hadn't listened to my husband, I wouldn't be in my exhibition. So it's just understanding and and once you're peaceful with that decision, you'll see everything then slots into place. Yeah, I appreciate that testimony, Shelley, because I think you're right. I think a lot of the women here would also agree with you. It is That is a very difficult position that women are in to obey these verses because not just the society as a whole, but churchianity. All, pretty much most every woman who they believe the gospel, they're going to heaven. Uh, it is so, so, so difficult for women to follow this because, number one, your flesh doesn't want you to follow it. And number two, the society is against it and churchianity is against it. And it's, um, you, you'll stand out like that. You know, women for the most part, because they're so concerned with how they look, they put so much emphasis on those things. You know, women spend usually a lot more money on clothing or hair appointments or those things than the men do. And you're told in 1 Peter 3 that the woman, uh, we, you know, we read it, um, 1 Peter 3, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. Uh, Lana recognized that and so she tried following that. But, you know, it's hard because, you know, here, like she tried to get a job, let's say. Um, if the woman doesn't dress up and meet the standard that society wants her to meet, even if she has all the qualifications and would be a good part of that job, she might not get that job. Um, you know, practically speaking, it's like it's like the woman is really because the because society is so concerned with how a woman looks, and if you as a woman are concerned about the inward man and not how you look on the outward, well, it's a lot easier to see that with a woman and then get penalized by your culture and by society for not following society norms. You know, for me. Um, I don't wear makeup or jewelry, and that's seen as perfectly fine as a man. And Ernie is right along with me. He loves that. <laughs> See, that society, I could go into an interview, 
and uh, obey my role as a man and probably get the job, you know, if I got the qualifications. If a woman has the qualifications but obeys her role as a woman, um, she may not get the job, you know. Um, and how do you do that? You know, you don't want to bring attraction to your outward appearance. Do you know how hard it is for a woman to find clothing that does not reveal a lot of her skin? Very easy for a man to find pants that go all the way to the shoes and to find a shirt that goes all the way to the neck. Um, Lana had difficulty in finding clothing that didn't show cleavage. I mean, that's just how, you know, society is. You know, how does a woman, you know, you have all the intents of obeying this, but you've got your, your flesh really is against this, and your society is against this, and you may be penalized for not following, uh, for, you may be penalized for following God in this. So, um, I, I think, you know, it's, I, I understand, and that's why I think, you know, the, and let me find that verse for you in Ecclesiastes um, that I, I mentioned, but I didn't know the reference. Uh, that's why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, I found a, I find a one in a thousand men, but I can't find a single godly woman out of a thousand. It's because it's a very difficult role for her to fill, I think. Um, Ecclesiastes 7, 28. Ecclesiastes 7, 28. Because the women are so concerned with the outward appearance, then you can see when they're not following society more than you can with the men. And so it's more difficult for a woman to follow. Um, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 27. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. It's so, uh, sorry, I just, uh, thinking of the Proverbs 31 woman, thinking of my wife, and, uh, and that's why it says in 1 Peter 3 that a woman like this, who is in the sight of God of great price, because it's a, uh, it's like, the, it's like the woman is the last of the creation and it's like God's crowning jewel that if the woman does what she's given the more difficult role and if she actually follows it, it is such a rare thing that is of great price to God to see. So, oh, sorry, getting emotional. But uh, thank you, thank you, Shelly, for that. It's, uh, and I understand that it's a very difficult thing for women to follow, so... I, I appreciate you. Like you say, it, the, the, another thing about the women, though, is they're able to, you give them the doctrine, if they, if they learn it, they'll follow it. Uh, and my wife was a great example of that. So uh, thanks, Shelly, for your comment. Uh, Danny, did you have anything? Or? Uh, no, nothing to talk about. Hello to everyone. Uh, great to study. Uh, no, nothing. It was, it was brilliant. It's... Uh, I could see those things coming out of my wife, so, uh, yeah, nothing to add to that, really. Just thank you, Mary. Yeah, thank you, and much love to Scotty as well for Friday. Yeah. Thanks, Danny and Shelley. Uh, Tom, you have a question or comment? No, Aaron, not today. I just want to kick back and listen to all the great questions, okay? I'm on call, so I may have to bug out. But oh. Thanks for a great lesson. All right, thanks, Tom. Thank H you. Helga, are you close by? you have a question or comment? Helga? She's probably not close by. Well, if you, if you get back, uh, just uh, show your face, and uh, then I'll know I can... Uh, Ask for a question or comment. Karen, do you have a question or comment? Um, I just want to say that this is a, a message I wish I would have had as a very young woman because um, churchianity does kind of twist this. I grew up in a church that took that scripture very seriously. But as, um, so women do not speak 
in the Church of Christ. Women do not facilitate. Um, they may co-facilitate nowadays as time has kind of uh, softened that a little bit in the Church of Christ. Um, but never are they, quote, pulpit pastors or ministers. So that's taken very seriously, but yet um, as you kind of grow, you are buffeted by the societal norms of women stepping up into those leadership roles in all different kinds of, of, of areas. You know, we step out of bounds as women all the time. And um, so then I graduated from that church doctrine to the whole other end of the spectrum where women are going up giving quote words of knowledge, women are speaking in tongues, women are interpreting. You very rarely hear a man's voice in the service other than the pastor himself. Everything else comes from the women. So that's kind of a, a full swing of a spectrum there and, and today this has been put right back in the balance where it needs to be uh, of God's word for women. I thank you immensely for this um, because I have a lot of women who call me up on a daily basis who are so, you know, they think that the freedoms and the liberties that they want to exercise is just that. When this right here is actually the thing that sets you free. Yeah. When you understand who you are and who God created you to be, then you're able to rest in that truth. Not looking to this one and not looking to that one. Like you mentioned, everybody's looking at women. You know, mom, at first it's the mom, then it's, you know, other women looking at other women to see how they measure up, to see where we fit in. Do we look the part? Are we this? Are we that? This takes that away. This just says, you know, God created you, and this right here is what he created you to be and to do. What more freeing can we have than that? Nothing that we can have confidence in who God created us to be. And I'm going to say this here as well. Ronnie and I are a prime example of right division being brought to me. Not to him, but to me. And so uh, how I handled that at first, of course, Ronnie and I have that conversation that, you know, he's not lording himself over me and demanding this and commanding me to do that. We have that mutual respect one for another in our marriage. So I listen to him, and guess what? He does listen to me, too. So that's awesome. But I was able to say to him, Ronnie, this is what was brought to me from Helen, and I think she's lost her mind, so you don't have to worry about it. I'll listen to it, and then we'll go from there, you know? And then after March, I mean, May the 5th, 2020, I walked outside after getting off that call, and I said, uh, Ronnie, um, there's something to this, and I wish that you had listened to it. And from that day forward, he kind of came in and, and feels as passionately, he's less vocal than I am, but he feels as passionately about it as I do. So, you know, I just, how, the, how you brought out today the scripture that says, um, the, the, the man can be won by the conversation of the wife. You know, that's exactly right. You know, God is so much wiser than we are. And if we would just learn to, to be in his word, to, as women, to adorn the doctrine, I appreciate so much what you have shared about Lana. Because although I never saw her face to face, I saw her, and I see her even today through your words, through how you build her up even today, and lift her, and, and share her with us. And so I see who she is, 
and who she was on this earth. So I thank you for that. But not only that, Eric, there is such gender confusion as society has put that out. You know, it's not who you are from your mother's womb. Ronnie and I were watching something last night on television and a commercial came on and I didn't even, wasn't even really paying attention to what the commercial was, but I caught a sentence in it and it said, it, it was about a medication and it said, if you are assigned female at birth, this would not be effective for you. If you are assigned female at birth, I'm like, did you just hear that? Are you assigned anything? God created male and female. From the womb, he declares who you are. So I thank you for not being gender confused, Eric, because you were a gift to Lana to take your role as a husband seriously. Do you know that many women don't have that? And, and to me, the testimony that you are, not only as you lift up your wife to share how she adorned the doctrine, but how you as the husband took your role, your responsibility seriously. That is a testimony to every man on this call, to every father, and to every husband. And I, as a woman, thank you so much for that right there because it is so freeing for me as a woman to submit to my husband in the godly way that I was created to do. So I thank you for this. I can't wait for this message to be posted because I have women who are so locked into a mindset of churchianity I cannot wait to share this with them. And I thank you so much for that. So that's my, my take on today. It's been wonderful for me. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that. This whole uh, gender thing that you, you decide for yourself, it's really taking God, who fearfully and wonderfully made you, and throwing that out the window. And that's what's so tragic about that. So I, I appreciate the, the woman's perspective you've given Karen on this. And uh, thank you. Um, Scotty, I, I'll skip you just because I know you have vocal problems. Um, but I appreciate your comment and you're in our prayers. Uh, Julie, do you have a question or comment? Um, I don't have a, a question or whatever, but certainly I'm... Paul and Karen, I can't, um, you know, really relate to the quote, husband and wife, because I've never been married, and I've been single, and I have no kids, but it was a very, very informative message, and so thank you so, so much. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, I recognize the society that we're in, and, you know, you don't have, uh, a lot of times, you don't have people that can fit these roles perfectly just because the curse of sin and the, and how the world is going. Um, so, you know, you just have to try to apply it as best you can using the mind of Christ to any situation. So, uh, But it's at least good to know what God's design is for the woman and for the man, even if you don't, you know, fulfill it exactly like that due to circumstances. You know, there are women who, like you say, you're single. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if you're if you have the ability, uh, it's best to stay single because then you can devote more of your time to the Lord. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's great that you're able to do that. And, um, you know, some women who end up getting married, they just physically aren't able to have kids. Or maybe the man isn't able to uh, impregnate her. You know, there are just other factors like this and maybe you don't have children. You know, that's how it was with, with me and Lana. Lana... Um, um, had to have a, for health reasons, had to have a, um, take out that, uh, her reproductive ability at an early age. So, um, she just couldn't have kids, you know, and so then, but she could, you know, as Karen said, she saw, she saw Christ through her so she could fulfill that role even though, um, she didn't fulfill the, the child role. So, you know, we just use the mind of Christ 
understanding what our roles are and applying it in our situation. So uh, thank you, Julie, for, for listening. Uh, Steve, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Eric. I think that was a very good teaching on a, a very touchy subject for a lot of a lot of people. Uh, <clears throat> I think one of the biggest reasons that uh, women can grasp things so much easier than men is because of this stubborn, bullheaded pride. They, they just don't want to let go of what they believe in, and it just takes longer to to uh, yeah. convey it to them, or like you said, a woman can take it and run right away with it. A man, maybe it takes a while longer. So thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, very good comment. Yeah, I think that's yeah one of the men's faults, and uh, women can, can do that. They can um, go along with it a lot easier, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, are you, uh, uh, if, if, if you're willing to share, how are you doing uh, health-wise? I know you had a doctor's appointment, and... Are things going along okay for you, or? Yeah, well, things have gotten better than they are right now, but we're okay. Uh, we got a, got two appointments next week. Uh, you know, you go inside and look around. Mm -hmm. They spotted something, and they want to investigate it more. So I don't know anything until after Wednesday. I get the second procedure done Wednesday. And uh, but then I think I think once they can get in there, they will be able to determine what's what. They got uh, we'll put a splint in to do some draining on something. Mm -hmm. So it'll be after be after Wednesday or after that procedure, and uh, hopefully we'll know something then we can go from there. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing, Steve, and we'll keep you in our prayers. I thank you, Eric, and I thank everybody. Cherish your prayers. Uh, Ronnie, do you have a question or comment? No? Okay. Uh, Larry Tidwell, do you have a question or comment? I do, Eric. Uh, I, you know, Tom, last week Tom was talking about us praying for you for that <laughs> Halloween thing. <laughs> And I want to tell you this, Tom, we better be praying for Eric now, because in my humble opinion, this subject is one of the toughest out there. Um, that the It seems as if to me, and that's just to me, that it's almost like an insult for a woman to do what Karen talked about. Yeah, uh, it's 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 almost like no way, man. You you're not this ain't gonna happen kind of thing. And if you look at that passage, and I, you probably think you went through this passage, Eric, in, in Ephesians five, wives, submit to yourselves as, unto your submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Submission is not an insult. Submitting is submitting as unto the Lord. And and I may be wrong, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think all this stuff is judgment seat things. Mm -hmm. That how we live this is how we'll, it'll be at the judgment seat. And it says, husbands, love your wives. It's not beat them into submission. The wife is to be protected. The man, that's why the men went to war and fought, is to protect. And to me, you know, I, I just, I have to tilt my hat to you, Eric, for even going through this. There's not many preachers or rightly divided out there that will will address this issue and I just hope my prayer is that the men will take it right and the women will take it right it's God that wrote the book not us and if you go back to Adam and Eve uh, you know when Eve took of the fruit 
and, Ad, and I don't know if Adam says, well, honey, if you're going to eat it, just give it to me. There might have been a little bit of talking going on there. Hey, wait a minute now. You're going to take this fruit. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I'd love to. I can't wait to see how that all worked out. But anyhow, Scotty, God bless you, Scotty. And Lisa, I'm telling you this too, Eric. Women pray so much better than men. Yes. My wife prays so much better than me. I say, Lord, heal her. And Lisa went through stuff that just, I, I squalled. I mean, it just, it's just, uh, women have such beauty outwardly and inwardly. And the inward part is so important. Your wife, I, I, re, I remember seeing you at Oak Mountain. I remember her. But I'll tell you this. Her stepping into eternity the way she did. But you talk about a testimony. I get emotional. I know you miss me. Well, Eric, you're one of my heroes, I'll tell you that. I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right about women. They uh, the, the thing about a woman's mind is she's real good at details, and men are really good more of a overview type thing. So it's you know just like you said, you pray for your wife, Lord heal her. Well, that's the summary version, you know. And uh, Lisa goes into the uh, the detail part, and uh, and I think that's why women try to. It's in their nature to try, in their sin nature to try to usurp authority over the man is because usually the woman sees a lot of things that the men don't see and uh so they're trying to like i say like my my grandfather you know the man may be the head but the woman is the neck and you know she needs to give her input to point him in the right direction because the man's not going to see that stuff so yeah the the woman i think is um uh, because of that detail-oriented mind has such beautiful prayers which you'll notice usually i'll ask lisa to you know pray for somebody um, you know, I don't mind praying, but uh, but it's just like the women are just uh, gifted with uh, with that uh, that detail mind and uh, having those beautiful prayers that uh, you know I can pray right doctrinally and uh, pray for you know and have you know good good prayer, but uh, it's it's not like uh, what a woman in that sound doctrine can pray for. So uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying there, Larry. Uh, Gail Salvage, do you have a question or comment? Uh, no, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. God bless you. Thanks. Connie, do you have a question? Connie, well, and Stan there. You're both there. Either you have a question or comment? Um, when you, I'm not, I don't want, I'm not trying to disagree with you. I just want, I just don't know how to say it. Okay. Um, when you talked about um, that uh, the, the God made me in secret, at one time I used to think that that's the way God did things, that he did made everybody just the way they are. But as I got older and I started seeing, uh, for example, one person I know had a child that whose brain was, was on the outside of the head. And the different um, way, because they were on, uh, not her, but other people, because they were on drugs, the child would be born with all kinds of handicaps. And um, so then I, I learned that because of sin being in the world, that there was corruption all around us and in men and women and all around. And the reason things like that happened was because of sin and corruption. And today you said that, no, 
that God made them that way to be defective or to be um, look like a monster when they're born or whatever. And um, I just learned something different today again. Well, I don't know. I mean, I see your point. It, you're right. You know, you have a, you know, they'll tell a woman, for example, don't smoke when you're pregnant. And if they do, you can have problems or taking drugs or, you know, and you can have these birth defects that are a result of what the, the, uh, you know, the mother does um, because that baby is in her body. So, but at the same time, God is making that body. I guess what I'm saying with the, with the Psalm 139 is that God is the one making that body. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, and he's making you for his purpose. That, But man could still alter that because of sin. Uh, but uh, who you're made for in eternity, and your soul and your spirit, that doesn't change. So you, you could have the, the birth defect, and God uses that with your soul and your spirit to... Uh, I think... and I. I don't understand how that all works because we are made in secret. But I would think that God, you know, knowing everything, that he considers that factor of the curse of sin and what that woman did, you know, smoking or taking drugs or, or whatever it was. Um, and he considers that when making the soul and the spirit. To And so then the woman, you know, she has that part in that where the... There's that birth defect or something where it looks like a monster because of uh, what's happened, um, you know, what she did. But that I think God makes the soul and the spirit to go along with that. And so then they, to glorify God to the maximum. So I think that's, so I guess what I'm saying is that I agree with you and that um, if someone drinks a lot or smokes or takes drugs or does, you can do things to uh, alter how that baby is born physically, but um, it's God who makes the soul and the spirit within that. I don't think those things are altered, and God keeps in mind how that physical body is going to be and makes the soul and the spirit to go along with that so that they can glorify God to the maximum uh, based upon the body that they're given. Because, you know, genetics has a lot to do with it too. Um, um, I am not seven foot tall because my parents are not seven foot tall. Uh, but Shaquille O'Neal is seven foot tall. Well, the God made him that way because that's where his parents are, you know. He was made black because his parents are black. I was made white because my parents are white. It, you know, there are a lot of genetic things. There are a lot of uh, things that the mother and father do that can change how that baby is born. Uh, but I think that's just physically. And then what God does is he comes in because God knows that the soul and the spirit are what lasts forever. And so God makes the soul and the spirit to go along with the body that he knows it's going to be. And uh, that's what's fearfully and wonderfully made, to, to glorify God to the maximum based upon how your body is going to be. And then when you consider in eternity that uh, we have that glorified flesh, and so any of the effects of the curse of sin. So you have a mother who is on drugs, and as a result, the physical body is bad. Well, uh, that's not God making that body bad. It was the, the mother taking the drugs that affected that. But uh, in eternity, God has a body, a glorified body for that person that's going to remove all the curse of sin. You know, I have really bad allergies, um, but I won't have that in heaven. You know, I can smell the roses and not sneeze. So I think that you've got... Um, it's the soul and the, the fearfully and wonderfully made primarily is that soul and the spirit that God makes okay. knowing how the body is going to be where it could be altered by genetics. I, you know, my parents knew I would never be seven feet, feet tall because that's just not what they were, you know. So um, you've got genetics, you've got um, things that people could do to make the, the baby healthy or unhealthy. Um, and... But that's all physical and all that due to the curse of sin and bad choices and that will all be removed in eternity when we have our glorified body. So uh, really um, the body, soul, and the spirit are all made by God 
without those defects, but it's just you have some of those things that take place, and then God makes the soul and the spirit to go along with it. Um, I've, I've noticed there are people who, you know, I've had contact with people who their mental capacity isn't as um, good, they call mentally challenged people. Um, you know, the people that I've met like that are just some of the nicest, sweetest people you'll ever meet. And uh, usually, and it's just, it's like God says, well, I understand that due to, you know, drugs or whatever that curse of sin, that that person is not going to have the mental capacity that a normal person does. So I'm going to make their soul and their spirit to go along with it. And you can just learn so much from somebody like that sometimes um, because God gives them the soul and the spirit that matches that. So um, th does that help? I mean, I'm sorry, I probably, yeah. I didn't say it correctly you when helped. I was going through it. Yeah, you helped. That really clarified it for me better. That I understand that. And I also want to tell you thank you for your bookmarkers. They were awesome. Oh, okay, great. Jerry brought them over this morning, so thank you. All right, yeah, they bookmarked with the uh, gospel on there, so that's good. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm going to give them away. All right, yeah, that's what they're there for. Thanks, Connie. Uh, did Stan have anything? Uh, your mic's on, Stan, but I don't hear you. He said thank you, but he really doesn't have anything. He really enjoyed it. All right. Thanks, Stan. Thanks, Connie. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ernie and Liz. Ernie and Liz, do you have a question or comment? Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm just using my laptop. So. I'm, just, I'm just getting over my phlebotomy yesterday, so I'm a little... A little white um, though. That's that's what I figured seeing you back there. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where do I start? First thing, yeah, we're thankful you don't put the makeup on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just reading in Proverbs 31. Elizabeth had this open. She had to take a phone call, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Verse 26 of Proverbs 31, it says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So, I don't know, like other husbands here on the call, uh, I learned after we just celebrated our 37 years of marriage. It's great. And it's taken me about 33 years to listen to what my wife says. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it, 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 like you were saying, women have insight and they can tell you, you know, you shouldn't do this or shouldn't say this, you know, even on Zoom calls, she'll nudge me and say, Argh, argh. so, you know, it, uh, <laughs> they, it, it's so true what you're saying, but the, you know, the two different minds and, uh, they just have an insight as to to things. I, I mean, I don't want to. I'm kind of the emotional one of of us. She's more stoic. I'm more. But you know, my wife visits me every day. It took her a, 45 minutes to come and visit me every day in the hospital for over five months when I was in the hospital. And. Uh, Verse 26 describes her. She opened her mouth with wisdom. I mean, every day she would come and she would encourage me, keep fighting, keep going. I need you in my life. And there was times I was so sick, I, did, I felt like, you know, just kind of giving up, shriveling up. And even though I couldn't move, I couldn't get out of the bed, you know, she was there looking after me. So I just want to say that, you know, wives, uh, I mean, if you knew us as, as young people, uh, we were very different. She's more, like I said, more stoic. I'm more of the emotional kind of, you know, uh, wear my heart on my sleeve kind of. But, you know, you compliment each other. And I guess you, 
It's sort of like Lenny and Lisa. Probably Lisa and I are more alike, and Lenny and Elizabeth are more alike. You know? So it's, but coming into right division, I was the one that kind of discovered it, and boy, she was right there with me. She's like, this unlocks the Bible to me. And uh, we, for the last, you know, four years or so, we've been just going strong and uh, trying to help each other understand the Word of God and to complement each other. Uh, but my part, one of my questions is, as a Christian, and I, there's not many any Christian young men on with us today, uh, maybe Danny and Shelley's boys, but as men, you know, we kind of went into marriage thinking, okay, you know, we're both going to have to work, but we're going to have to, you know, buy a house and that sort of thing. Uh, it should a Christian man not marry if he can't support a wife that should stay at home? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, the, the criteria that Paul gives you in 1 Corinthians 7 is really basically what he says is that um, all of us have our proper gift of God. Some of us have a desire, a, a greater sexual drive than others. And if it's the point where it's going to um, be a problem where you will get into sexual sin as a result of a strong drive, then you should get married. And if not, then you shouldn't get married because then you can devote yourself to the Lord. That's primarily uh, the reason there. Like, uh, you know, I was married to Lana 11 years. Um, I doubt I'll ever get married again because as you get older, that drive isn't there as much, you know. Um, it's just, that's basically what he says, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Um, and then he'll even tell you, uh, uh, verse 9, if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Um, he says in verse 8, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So really, that's... That may not be the way the world looks at things, but really the primary, because they just, they have sexual drive, they just satisfy it even though they're not married, they don't care. Uh, but the way God says it basically is um, you have the drive that God has given you, and if it's something where you need to, to avoid sin, uh, you need to get married, then you should get married. But if not, then you shouldn't get married. That's really the consideration. Now, yeah, I realize in today's society, you've got, you know, expenses and all these things to where both the woman and the man, usually if you get married nowadays, uh, in a lot of cases, both need to work outside the home. And then what are you going to do in terms of, well, should we even have kids? And if we do have kids, how is the woman going to fulfill her role in uh, raising them up? And, you know, that's just one of those situations that you just use the mind of Christ to figure out what you do in that situation. My advice would be if your mind is focused on the things of God, then you can cut down your expenses tremendously. You know, you don't have to buy the most expensive clothes. You don't have to eat at the fancy restaurants. You don't have to have the most expensive car. You know, I had a car for 20 years and the only reason I got rid of it is because it was costing too much to maintain it. And I replaced it with a car that was that would be reliable and was cheap compared to... I got a new car, but I got it at a much cheaper rate than most all new cars. Um, because I'm not concerned about the things of the world. So I can... Uh, you know, And I just bring that up as an example because Lana was able to stay at home and uh, not work because the both of us didn't spend a whole lot of money on these things of the world. So my my advice to the to the man and the woman who need to get married or they're married uh, is that you need to see your roles and try to fulfill them as best you can. So then, if the if you end up having kids, then you want the woman to stay at home and to train up those children. 
Um, but practically speaking, maybe, and so then you cut back. If you make that a priority, then you cut back on the things of the world so that maybe you can do that. Or if the woman has to work, maybe she only works 20 hours a week. You know, yeah. um, you know a part-time job. Uh, value your children over the things of the world is really what I would say. But, you know, maybe both of you have to work full-time. And so then you got to figure it out. And another big factor is training up a child in the way you should go. I think ideally in this environment that we're in today and what they're promoting at schools, you really want to have your child either in a private school or you teach them at home. And the ability to do that is being taken away uh, by you know a lot of folks like uh, for example you know uh, Nathan's not able to teach at the conference well his wife she uh, she um, took a job uh, working getting away from the public school system took a job in the um, in a private school but then and so then that way it was basically she is more like a uh, overseeing the uh, parents who were homeschooling their children. That was her job. Well, now California passed a law between school years and said that, uh, that basically parents aren't allowed to do that anymore. And so now she, her job was to oversee the parents who were teaching the kids, and now she's got to teach the kids. She's got to come up with the lesson plans because the government there in California says you can't teach your kids anymore homeschool. At least that's the way I understand it, and that's how her job changed. So... Uh, I mean, it's basically God taking, I mean, the government taking away the God-given role of the mother to train up the children in the ways of God. That's her role, and the government takes it away. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, well, then you end up having to not teach your kids that, but then you try to not work a job and then try to unbrainwash your kids as much as possible in the time you have with them. So, I mean, there are all these complications, the way society is and everything. So, uh, my, my advice is you try to stick to these roles as much as you can. But if you have to have the woman working full-time, well, then you figure out, you know, what would the mind of Christ be in this? How do I go against what the society, public school system is teaching? How do I, you know, and you, you think of those things. So, and if you prioritize putting your children first and the things of God over the material, then you're more likely to be able to follow what God would want you to do um, in those situations. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're going to have to rename you. I, we call, I called you Eric the Edifier, but I think we're going to have to also add Eric the Endurer. You know, you really show endurance, brother. Like, uh, like Larry was saying, uh, wow. You know, you've been through a lot, and uh, you're still going. So, I think we can prove. Thank you for. You know, you were saying about Lana adorning the word. Well, uh, you do as well. So, uh, you're you're a great example to us all. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ernie. Um, Jerry Brown, did you have a question or comment? Yes, for a comment, uh, what a great place to be on a Sunday afternoon with you guys. Uh, really encouraged by... Uh, that's not the correct way. I guess it's encouraged, but I guess the learning curve um, and thankful is the other word would be from the ladies who spoke, like Shelly, Karen, and, and the other ladies who spoke about only the life that they could speak from as a woman and the, and the journey they're on in this tremendous warfare of the principalities and powers of evil trying to get them to march to a different tune than the one that you taught on today, Eric. You did a great job. That was a good learning curve for me also. It was really neat to hear the, the ladies speak on that and uh, the kindest comments. and That this uh, go-to meeting was available today for us to meet and do this. Uh, we're not a this anywhere else in regular churches. And, uh, 
Yeah. Karen's going to put it to work. I can see Shelly and all the other ladies. And also as men, it be a learning curve for us, too, to understand what they're going through and the uh, pressure from the principals and piles of the air. So I thank everybody, and great, uh, great study. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Jerry. Um, just a reminder before we go that uh, we have our conference coming up. Did you want to go ahead, Lisa? Um, you go first with the guy over there. Oh, I'm just going to remind everybody we have the uh, Salvation from What conference December 3rd through 5th, Slidell, Louisiana. If you can't make it in person, you can watch on Zoom. So uh, just a reminder for that. Uh, go ahead, Lenny and Lisa. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Lisa's. Uh... Text Lisa, or uh, email Lisa, do you have an email on there? Got any it's questions? on the email that Eric sent to everyone. And uh, email Eric, email Lisa, if you have any questions. And uh, I want to sound like a, a hawker, but we would love to see a whole bunch of folks there in person. And, and what we do understand, if you can't come, how to hang out at home and hang out on the video with us. We'll enjoy seeing that too. But just wanted to pray for everybody before we left, if that's okay. Sure. I, I, I might let Lisa pray since she's so good at it. I might start and let her finish. How's that say? That sounds good to me. <laughs> Father, what, uh, what Jerry said is ringing in my ears to, to listen to the ladies. They do have a very, very important job here on earth for them. First, they got to take care of us. That's hard enough, as they know, and us men know it too. They got to take care of us. And then, it, especially if they have children, they got to care for them and oversee them and adorn the doctrine. That was so beautiful what Eric was saying today, just... Uh, have that Christ that's in them, that is the detail, that is the nurturer, that is the house runner, the house take care of, to have that be fulfilling in them, that they fulfill them, that that is part of godly living for a lady. And as Karen so elo eloquently stated, that is peace, that is joy. And uh, we know that the evil one does not want our ladies to, uh, to have that. And that our men can be warriors and uh, providers, go out and take the blows and take the mess of the world and come back home to, uh, to a home well run, well cared for, and uh, well loved by that uh, beautiful lady. Well, I, uh, I'm so grateful that uh, my beautiful lady here is who she is, and that I get to see it in her, and I get to see her growing up in the doctrine, in the Christ that is in her. As we sit together on Sundays and Tuesdays, and that we... Uh, Growing up together as we feed off of each other, the things we learn and share and uh, the struggles and the questions. And it's all good because I get to share it with Lisa and she gets to share it with me. Well, I pray for the uh, conference coming up that the men and the ladies that are putting it together that are wanting to share the love of God through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we can thank you so much that Eric uh, pours his heart into us but he studies as Lana poured her heart into him and that she made things comfortable for him that she ran the home for him so he could get into the word and fulfill the leader, the, the pastor, the, the teacher of our little body who is, wow, that, that's all I can say about our body. I, I don't even have a word for you guys and gal. Wow. So Father, thank you for Eric and uh, pray that you will comfort 
fulfill him, fill him this week, next week, as uh, as we prepare to get uh, Tuesday night going, and uh, the mess that we have to live in. Father, the darks are coming. They're coming, Father. So may we put on that armor of faith. May we walk in the love of, in Christ that we have in the inner man, as we can uh, love our wives, love our husbands, as we can go out and love the mess that we walk into every day. And I thank you so much for all of this in Christ's name. Father, I too just want to say thank you for today. Thank you for Eric Newman, Lord, and the word that he has read and studied and learned through your Holy Spirit, that he can take it and teach it to us, God. We we need your word in our inner man. Grow us up to, as Lenny prayed, help us fight the war we're in every day, Lord, um, moment by moment sometimes. The spiritual war, Father, the, the flesh. Um, you've conquered all these things on the cross through your Son, your precious Son, Jesus Christ, and we're forever grateful. So, Father, I just thank you for Eric, for all the time he takes, because he loves us. And, Lord, thank you that he can share his heart with us, and we can love Eric Newman. And may we pray for him and lift him up when we think of him. I thank you, Lord, for each new day that he can walk in your grace and your comfort and your love, Father, and that I pray you will be the God of all comfort to him each day, Father God. I do want to pray for Steve McDonald, for Ernie, for Scotty. Their physical needs are great, Lord, and I'm so thankful to you, Lord, that their spirits are complete, their souls are 100% complete in you. They know where they're going, Father, but this earth is just dragging them down. And I just pray for your peace, your love, your life in them to be everything to them as they face the physical struggles, Lord. We lift up our brothers and sisters, and thank you for everybody that joined today, Lord. Our, we're knit together in love, as Karen and I talked about yesterday. We are knit together in love, and we can comfort one another through your love, through your life your word and I pray this all in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Um, well, that'll be it for today. Uh, Tuesday night I'm planning on covering the uh, threefold rejection of the Godhead by Israel and get into early acts in our Bible overview. So hope you can That's join great. us then. So have a good day everybody. See you next okay. time. Bye everybody. Bye, Steve. Bye, Lisa.